we did order the parts for me to fix that original speaker that we had and got to Mobridge and then for some reason they turned around and sent it back again. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there, but something about our address, which all the UPS drivers know where we live, so I don't get that. But um, Today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to go into loop six. And there is a sermon that's called the Sermon on the Plain. Now, the Sermon on the Plain is different from the Sermon on the Mount, although there are similarities. There are Beatitudes in both of them. But when Luke wrote about this, there's enough differences to say that Jesus brought the same point in both places. So we're going to go into that. And the concept here is the fact that Jesus kind of turned the worldview upside down. So that God's view is different than the worldview. So we'll talk about that. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we start here. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you've given us your word and we can go into there and see what Jesus has said and see the things that you wanted us to hear. And Lord, I pray that you give me the words that you want spoken as we get into this time of study. And Lord, I just praise you for all that are gathered here. Lord, I ask you to protect those that are not here today with us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's start up with the setting here. It says in uh, Luke 6, 12, it says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So this is the first time. This is early on, uh, but this is the first time that he calls the 12 the 12. He gathers them to him. So he's up on the mountaintop. He calls them up there. And then in Luke 6, 17, it says, He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. All these people had come, yes, to hear Jesus, but also for healing and all those things. They'd come to see Jesus. That was their purpose. And there's a big crowd there. Not just his disciples, not just the twelve, but more than that. When it says a large crowd of his disciples, there was uh, estimated by some biblical scholars that there were 200 people that were following Jesus around. It wasn't just 12 guys. It was a lot more than that. But this big crowd is gathered, and this is who Jesus is addressing. So he starts out in Luke 6, 20 through 22. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. So here's four blessings. Like I said, this is different than Temple on, or Sermon on the Mount because they have the Beatitudes are much longer there. But he gives four specific blessings. And when I said upside down, this is what he's talking about. He will go back and, and give one side and then the other. And this is his blessings. He said, Yours is the kingdom of God. You will be satisfied. You'll laugh. And um, when people hate you, they'll exclude you. But you will be taken in to heaven. And the concept here is that uh, the people he's talking to are the lower parts of society. They're not the upper parts of society. These are the lower parts of society. These are people that came to him for healing. These are people that came to him to hear about the kingdom of God from him. Completely different than the rest of society, which is getting it from the Pharisees. Now, this whole thing takes place right after he healed that withered hand. Remember how he healed the withered hand in the, in the synagogue, and they went after him for it because he healed somebody in front of him? So this is happening, and Jesus is explaining these things. Now, he doesn't say that there's anything evil or wrong with being on the other side of this, unless there's a problem with your heart. And this is where this comes from. So when he says, blessed are you who are poor, it doesn't mean we're all supposed to be poor to be Christians. That's not what he's talking about. It doesn't mean that we need to be starving. You know, it's really sad if I, you look at the world. We are one of the richest countries in the entire world, by far. Those that are in the lower echelons in the United States for income underneath what we call our poverty level are still way better than other countries. We live a very comfortable life in the United States, and we don't really recognize that. 
And as Christians, we live a pretty easy life too because we don't get persecuted like they do in other countries. I haven't heard of a person around here lately who was killed for being a Christian, but it happens in other countries. So why are they blessed? Well, in Luke 6.23, it continues, and it says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that's how their ancestors treated the prophets. Now this is interesting because it says, Their ancestors treated the prophets. This is a pointed and specific thing where he's talking <laughs> about the Pharisees. He's talking about the religious leadership. The prophets were treated the same way, he says. They were treated as being lesser people because of the, the afflictions. Now, same thing goes on here. In Luke 4, 18 through 19, Jesus is actually quoting Isaiah 61 here. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover of the recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this is... This particular passage comes when Jesus is back in Nazareth. He's in his hometown. And he's in the synagogue, and he pulls out the scroll from Isaiah and reads this. And at first, I mean, people are like, whoa, that's pretty good for this carpenter's son. We remember him as a kid. Remember, we've talked about that before. You grew up in one area, and the people there remember all the things you did wrong when you were younger. You know, people still remember you with a runny nose and all that good stuff. Acting up in class, all those kind of things. Now you're different. Well, Jesus is reading this specific passage from Isaiah. He's not quoting himself. He's quoting Isaiah. And he says, and it says down here, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He says, this is it. it. The kingdom has come. So what do they do in his hometown when he reads this? They take him out. They're going to throw him off a cliff and kill him. And it says he just disappears into the crowd. But they're, in his hometown, they were going to kill him for for reading a section of scripture. So when he says rejoice in that day and leap for joy, he's treated the same way. Jesus is not treated any different. And this happens before he speaks. This is in Luke 4, we're in Luke 6. So Jesus has gone through this in his own hometown where he is considered to be a threat. He's considered to be a problem. And yet he's doing all these things. He's restoring sight. He's proclaiming freedom for the prisoners. And he's setting the oppressed free. He's doing those things, and yet they consider him a threat. Why? Why would the world consider that to be a negative thing? Well, if you look at a typical worldview, and that's a typical worldview then, and it's a typical worldview today, power is the most important thing. People want to be at the top of the food chain and not at the bottom of the food chain, and they'll do anything to get there. I'm taking a class right now, my master's class is uh, on uh, um, supervision. And I, it's, I, I'm taking it through Liberty University, which is a Christian university, and I love that because every one of my professors talks about Christ first and the class second. And they talk about the concept of servant leaders. And he, he had a little video with my professor, and he had a triangle. And he said, the worldview is... You try and get to the top of the triangle. Your goal is to get promoted and get a better job and get better and better and get to the tip of the triangle. And he said true leadership is just the opposite. And he flipped the triangle upside down. He said true leadership is being on the bottom, like Jesus said, those who be first, or those who want to be first should be last. And everybody should be above you. I love that example. That's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. So let's talk about the other side. What's a woe? I'm not talking with an H here. This isn't horses. Uh -oh. Often in the Bible we hear woe. And that is a terrible thing. Woe is you. If you're this, if you're that. We hear that in the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But we had four blessings. And now we get the woes. He followed blessed are you with woe are you if. And here he goes. But woe to you who are rich. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe, woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Remember how he said, if they hate you, that's the way they treated the prophets? Now he says, 
if they're praising you, that's how they treated the false prophets. And this is the world view again. Okay? We went from his view and the view and the God, godly view to the world view. And this is the world view. He's not saying that if you have money that it's that it's evil. Now, it never says that in the Bible. People say, well, money is evil. No, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's what he's talking about here. If your focus is, I'm rich, I'm good, I'm well fed, I'm good. This is what was going on in his society at that time, and it still is today. We have people that play games for a living that make millions and millions and millions of dollars. And yet we have people that don't have enough food in this same country. How can we pay somebody millions of dollars to play a game and not feed other people? And yet it happens. In this period in time, the Pharisee would say, if you're rich, it's because you're doing things right, so God's blessing you. So you got it in the bag. If God's blessing you, you're covered. Same thing with all the other ones here. If God's blessing you, then you must be doing it right. They saw, they saw all these things as a, as a result of righteousness. And that's not what God says. There's a difference between being self-righteous or righteous in the world's eyes and being righteous in God's eyes. And the difference is simple because when we talk about righteousness in the world's eyes, it's based on success, right? Everything is based on success, being the best at something. And Jesus says, if you're poor, you're the best at something. Because if we come to him like this, we're going to get a negative reaction from God. If we come to him knowing who we are, that's why in the, in the Sermon on the Mount he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's not saying people that have no faith. He's, he's saying people that understand who they are in relationship to God. That poor in spirit concept. He's kind of repeating a theme here. We've seen these things in other places. We see them all, all elsewhere in the gospel. The rich young ruler. Jesus says, do these things. Do all these things. He says, I've done all that stuff. I've gotten it all down. And Jesus says, well, give, rid of, give away all your money. And that's the one thing that he couldn't get rid of. And that was the anchor that was tearing him down. And it said he went away sadly because he knew he couldn't give away his money. Remember the story about a rich man and the camel and the eye of the needle? There's a lot of different uh, people that have different views on that one. But it's, it's an allegory. I mean, when he's talking about this, obviously a camel will never fit through that a needle. Nobody's made a needle big enough to put a camel through it. In this time, camels were the largest animals that were native to this area. But what he says is it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. And again, it's not the money that's the problem. It's the love of the money. It's the desire for money. <coughs> Remember this one? <coughs> the disciples see the lame man and says, who sinned? And Jesus said, you're looking at it wrong. He's not cursed because somebody did something wrong. In that case, he said, he's here for the purpose of me healing him and showing it to you. Whitewashed tombs was a relation to the religious leaders of the day. He said they're hollow. They look good on the outside, but they're full of rotting stuff on the inside. This is that worldview. It looks good on the outside, but it's really not. It's not going to do you any good. And then the last one I put in here is just simply that according to the world, these guys are blessed. This stuff is blessings. That's a blessing. According to heaven, that could be your anchor. We all have things in our lives that we have to let go of. It can be anything. Anything that is separating us from God. Anything that is more important to us than God. If you have any possessions that you would not give up if God told you to, that's your anchor that's tearing you down. That's that rock that's tied to your feet. Okay? Any of these things can be a problem. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And especially since the world celebrates one side of it, God's got a different opinion on that. How many times have you seen mega pastors with huge churches, Huge followings. 
books, all sorts of things, private jets, all that kind of stuff, fall. According to the world, they're at a pinnacle. According to all religious believers in the country, they're at the top. They got TV shows, they got radio shows, they got all this kind of stuff. I remember one very popular pastor right now, uh, I read something he was talking about as a kid, they were driving past a football stadium and he said, someday I'm gonna be, that's gonna be mine and I'm gonna preach there. He told his father on their way to church and I thought, well that's the wrong, as a very young age, that's a wrong perception. Success is not measured in any of those things. Success in this world is the understanding of who we are and who God is. Oh, here's one that people hate to hear. They hate to hear this. Because forgiveness, from our perspective, is one of the hardest things we have to do. In Luke 6, 27-31, he says, love your enemies. <clears throat> but you are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And that is, you know, we call that the golden rule there, but <clears throat> love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. That's where it gets sticky. He doesn't say, just don't get angry at them. Just ignore them. He doesn't say, put a wall between them and don't get offended. He says, do good to your enemies. That's asking a lot, isn't it? It's interesting, I, uh, I see this passage, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone slaps you on the cheek, that's a personal <coughs> Have you ever heard somebody say, well, that was a real slap in the face because of the way something, somebody spoke to you. And Jesus says, don't make a big deal out of being offended. So what? If another human being offends you, so what? It's not a big deal. In the scheme of things, as Christians, we should understand, in the scheme of things, that's small. That's a small thing. When Christ could sit up, would, could hang on the cross and look at the people who pounded nails through him and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I got nothing to compare to that. I have nothing that's ever been done to me in my life that I, that I can't say I forgive you. There's no way. We have to understand this concept of loving your enemies. Because if we do these things... As you would have them do to you. If we do these things, we can change an enemy into a friend. And we can change someone who's an enemy to God into a friend of God. Simply by loving them back for their hatred. Tough thing to think about. It's really hard for us sometimes to forget past injuries, past insults. It's hard. But that's what God is asking us to do. And Jesus says right here, Sometimes we hear, see it written in other translations. Let him who has ears, let them hear. If you are listening, you who are listening to what I say, okay? You can hear things but not listen to it. Listening means you're, you're taking it in. You're listening to what they're saying. And he says, if you are listening to me, love your enemies. We just went through this blessings and woes, and now he drops in to love your enemies. Wow. This is a tough message for people to hear, but it's a good message. Okay. Here's his flip side. This is where I said everything's upside down. He flips it around here. He says, love your enemies, and now in 632 through 36, he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to, lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. 
Then your reward will be great, and you will be, be the children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Okay, here's that high standard again. But again, it's a standard that we should understand. It says in, in the, the golden rule, the last line of the, of the last passage that I read, it said, do unto others the way you want them to do unto you. Here he's saying, do unto others the way you want God to do to you. Understand who you are. So the flip side of loving your enemy, he says, okay, yeah, it's not meaning to love the people that love you. It's awesome, but why is that something special? If you're good to people that are good to you, great. But why is that godly love? That's just love. That's just taking care of people. That's just the stuff in your family, with your children, with your grandchildren. Yeah, everybody does that. Jesus said, you are supposed to go beyond that. You are supposed to be above the world. If you do what the world does, even the good things the world does, so what? It's no big deal. You know, is, it, is it a godly thing to, get, to lend somebody money that you know is going to pay you back? You can do that, that's fine. But don't expect that to be something that you're going to be rewarded for in heaven. He said, give without, one, without worrying about being repaid. Remember in the beginning it said, if, if someone takes your coat, don't hesitate to give them your shirt too. If somebody's in need, give it to them. That's a difference. Okay? All of these things he's, list, he's listing here doesn't cost you anything. And Jesus said we have to pay. We have to invest. We have to put our money where his mouth is. We have to be investing in the kingdom of heaven. And then the interest is accruing in eternity. Anything else we do is, so what? Nothing to it. Luke 6, 37. Oh, ooh, ooh. here's another one. There's another challenge, isn't it? Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. But with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is an interesting concept here. If we look at this concept from the time period that he's in, okay? If you were not a farmer, you had to buy your grain to make your bread. That was a staple of their diet was bread. And it would be bought as grain, not as flour. Because grinding the flour... You can store grain for a long time. You can't store flour for very long. Flour itself, especially in those times, would go stale very quickly. Okay? It's, it's not good to keep it. But you get them, you buy the grain and you grind it yourself, then you have the flour. And it would be something that would happen on a regular basis. People would have to go and buy their grain for the day. One of the problems you had with merchants in those days is they would have different measures. And you'd go and say you want so much. And they're, what they measured it in, their measuring cup, if you want to put it in that context, might be a little smaller than the reality. And it says here, for the measure you use, it will be measured out to you. Now, if you've ever had grain, I, I remember this as, as a kid, in a bucket, and you want to fill it, if you just pour it in there, it's not really as full as you can get it. <coughs> And it says here, it's given, it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's the difference between somebody using a little cup and brushing the top off so you, you only get the little cup, and shaking it and pushing it down and shaking it and pushing it down, and then heaping it up over the top and giving. Traditionally, at this point in time, once you get your stuff, people would take the front of their clothing, hold it up. That, that's what they would carry that grain home in. And when they got it home, they'd dump it in their, in their pestle and mortar and work it. So when he says put in your lap, it's what, that's, a, that's a typical thing that they would have understood at the time. But he's saying, what's he saying is going to be shaken and, and, and pushed down and running over? 
Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Again, the standard is the same standard as what God is giving to us. As Christians, we should look at this and understand this concept. Because God sent his son to die for us and shed his blood for us simply because nothing else would cover that payment. So if we have received that payment from God, if we have received salvation, that no, no other way we could get it, that's the only thing, only way we could get it, at that price, how much does it cost us to forgive someone else? Remember the servant. Jesus had a parable about the servant. The servant came in and had a debt that, that he could never, ever pay back in his entire lifetime. And the ruler said, I forgive you your debts. And he walked out and immediately saw someone who owed him a little bit of money and wanted him thrown in jail for owing him that little bit of money. What'd that ruler do? He said, wait a minute. I just forgave you this and you won't forgive that. And he grabbed him and threw him in the prison. This concept is not a new concept for Jesus. He talks about it a lot. We should forgive the way we have been forgiven. That's what being a follower of Christ is. We should love enemies, love those who hate us. That's what being a follower of Christ is. We should look at things from a godly view instead of a world view. That's what being a follower of Christ is. So as he's speaking to these people, he's making it very clear to them. Especially if they're coming in and physically they are poor. They are mourning. They are doing these things. If that's what's happening physically in their lives, he said, God, you're going to rejoice in heaven. You may not get it here on earth, but you're going to rejoice in heaven. But woe to those that grab a hold of the earthly things. I think that's more important. Matthew 6.33 Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. If your mind is set on God, don't worry about it. Everything else is covered. Luke 6, 39 and 42, Jesus said, he told this parable, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? So the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Okay, again, the worldview is coming up here. He's talking about the, the Pharisees. If you follow someone who is a whitewashed tomb, are you not also a whitewashed tomb? They're going to walk off a cliff and you're going to be holding their hands when they go. A blind person should not lead a blind person around because they run into things. <clears throat> and no one wants to be called blind, especially to God. I'm blind to God's ways, well... Don't do that. But then he says, the student is not above the teacher. However, if the student is well trained, they will be like their teacher. Why does he say this? Well, there's two teachers he's talking about here. Himself and the worldview teachers that are coming. And he says, who are you following? If you're following someone that's taking you the wrong way, you can be really well trained in the world. But that's still going to lead to damnation. But following God, as close as we follow Jesus, then we can be like him. Okay, we can't be him. We can't be above Christ. But we can be like him if we follow him. There's that judgment coming back. He threw this in the middle. You notice that? Judge not, lest thee be judged. Don't condemn unless you're going to be condemned. He throws this in the middle again. Because his point is, who are you following? He's giving us all these things, but he has to go back and tell us again, don't follow the world. And then he comes in and says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Again, he's putting this concept out there that how can you criticize somebody else and tell them they're doing something wrong if you haven't gotten rid of what's wrong in your life? What gives you the right to judge someone and to stand, stand before someone and say, 
I need to help you fix what's wrong with you. When you haven't fixed what's wrong with you. We have to make sure that our, we seek righteousness with God first before we do anything else. We need to be following Christ first before we do anything else. Oh, application time. We've talked, I always try to end this with an application. So how do we take what Jesus said here in Luke 6 and make it part of who we are? What do we pull away from this that is personal, that we can use, that we could write down, that we could think about, that we can meditate on, that we could seek guidance on in the Bible? What is it about this passage from the Sermon on the Plain that God is trying to make alive for us? Well, he answers that himself. I skipped over a little piece in the middle here, and I went to Luke 6, 46 through 49. That first one should scare every one of us. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Because Jesus later on says, when the time of judgment comes, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy for you and do miracles in your name? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. You can say you did all those things, but if you're not following him, if your heart is not there, if you are not poor in spirit, if you're not understanding that Without Christ, we get nothing. If you're not understanding that we should be falling on our knees before Christ every single day in worship and in praise and understanding of who God is and who we are and what we are worth, we're priceless to Him and we're worthless to the world. Unless you are upside down. Then you're priceless to the world and that would make you worthless to Him. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. That foundation comes from the word. That foundation comes from the teachings of Christ. Because if we don't have that, if that's not what we're basing our lives on, we are not built on a solid foundation. There is a large 600-pound rock that was brought to the school this week. And I got asked by the business manager, she said, are you going to be around about 4.15? I said, yeah, I'll still be in the weight room. And she said, well, we got this rock, and it's sitting on a pallet. We need somebody to take it off the pallet. So uh, it's a beautiful, one of those laser-cut rocks that says Home of the Tigers and has the, the uh, mascot on there. And they built that new commons area and then put it up front. And they got all the fancy fabric down and then all this river rock on top of it out there. So we dig through all that. We get all the way down. It's got two little stone feet. We dig it down. We got to level those off. We go through all that stuff to put it there. And as I'm doing it, I'm saying, hmm, got a 600-pound rock on top of fabric. It might... You know, we're leveling it, as much, leveling it off as much as we can, but you put that kind of weight on there, is it still going to be where it was before you put weight on? Whatever. We put it on there. We flip it off the pallet, and, and this, these, myself and one of the guys squeeze it up there, get it on there, fill the rocks back in. It looks nice. It looks wonderful. I mean, it's, it's fancy. Later on that evening... Business managers leaving the building, and there's a bunch of first grade girls over there kissing the tiger, which I thought was kind of an interesting thing, and rocking it back and forth. So I come in the next day and it's laying on its side, covered up with plastic. It did not have a solid foundation. Eventually, somebody tipped that over, and with all our luck, it fall on the first grader that was trying to kiss the tiger, right? Buddy in the back would be going like this and schmuck. When we were putting it together, I said, you know, this would be easier if we had some rebar and concrete. It would be easier to level off a, a pad of concrete than to level off that dirt. Well, guess what's going to happen? They're going to drill holes in the bottom of that rock, put rebar in it, and put it in the concrete. Set it on a solid foundation. It can look really pretty. From a world standpoint, your house can look really, really pretty. you got everything going for you. Boy, isn't that a nice house? But if you built it on a, on a pile of marshmallows, it's not going to last very long. Same thing here. He says, if you are laid on the foundation, when the, when the things of the world come against us, they will, 
When the flood comes, the torrent that struck that house could not shake it, because it was well built. But the man who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. This happens a lot in the Middle East. Building a house is tough. Putting rocks down as a foundation is a tough... It, it takes a while. It takes a lot of money. You may spend as much money on the foundation as you do on the home. Okay? But I can tell you for, for a fact, when I was in Venezuela, um, on the outside edge of town, Venezuela sits in the bottom with mountains all the way around it. There's actually a tunnel from the airport into the city. There's a tunnel, uh, this airport's out by the ocean. And the, so the whole town is kind of built around there. As it got bigger, it just started building up the hills, right? The poor people in town, in the favelas, live in houses made out of corrugated sheet metal. It's got four walls of tin. That's it. And because they're going up the hill, what they would do is they would build on their neighbor's roof. So you can go and see this huge hill covered with these little tin shacks on top of each other. And every single year there is a monsoon season in that part of South America. And half of those buildings will wash down the hill. And there will be people killed every year. Now some of that is poverty and they don't have the ability to build anything any better than that. Especially in Venezuela today, they've got over a thousand percent inflation. We're complaining about the price of food, right? Because it went up a little bit. You ever check the cost of peanut butter lately? That one always irritates me. Oatmeal, for goodness sakes, you pay eight bucks for a thing of oatmeal. I know exactly what the farmer got, and we're eight bucks for that. But in those countries, it's almost impossible to get food. But this concept of building on that foundation of the rock is what Jesus is talking about. No matter what is going on in the world, if your foundation is strong, you'll be able to withstand it. There are people in this world that are very, very happy. But the things of this world, things happen all the time. And it's not necessarily sent by God, it just happens. It floods all the time. When we were in North Carolina, you go out to the beach, you know, down by Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, some places like that. They got million dollar homes right on the ocean. About every three years, a hurricane comes and blows them down. They'll build them on stilts, thinking, oh, that'll work. That's not a good foundation for a house when a hurricane comes in. There are people that will build beautiful mansions because they get a nice view of something. And then the ground will shift underneath them, and they lose the whole thing. Jesus is saying, when the floods come, that flood might be a long-term illness or cancer. That flood might be a complete reversal of all the finances. You got to invest it somewhere and everything collapses. And now you got nothing. That flood could be a fire that burns everything you own right down to the ground. That flood can be an awful lot of things. The difference between someone with a foundation in, in God and the foundation in the world is that when you when the things of this world are destroyed and your whole foundation was that stuff, you're going to be destroyed with it. If your foundation is God and that stuff's destroyed, you just remember God said, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else comes along. You can recover from anything in this world. Even if it kills you, you can recover it if you are saved. Because there's an eternity waiting for us that goes way beyond the small little problems we have on this earth. We cannot look at the world and say, this is the worst thing that could happen to me. Because the worst thing that can happen to you is, not, is being sent to hell for eternity. That's the worst thing. So if you build your foundation in, in, or you build your house on the sand and it washes away and it washes you away, you're gone. But if we build it on the rock, we're saved. That's the simple application. It's the worldview versus God's view. And Jesus said, put your focus on God. Put your, rock, put, your, put your faith into the rock. Do you remember when Jesus first said, called Simon a 
rock. Think about that. You know, that's not necessarily a nice thing to call somebody, but he called him Cephas. Simon Peter, he called him a rock. Because they were talking about what people were saying about Jesus, and Jesus said, who do you think I am? And Peter's the first one to stand up and say, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. Not on Peter. He's not saying, I'm going to build my church on Peter. Contrary to the Roman Catholic Church, Peter is not what he said, I'm going to build it on. He's going to build it on the rock of the truth that he is the Messiah. And when we believe in that, that's our foundation. So for application, think about these things. Put yourself in this place. Do you forgive the way you're supposed to forgive? Do you give the way you're supposed to give? Do you give without resentment when someone doesn't pay you back? Can you turn the other cheek and say, that was an insult that I can let slide. And if they insult me again, I can still let that slide. It's not a big deal. It's a big deal in the world. It's not a big deal to us. When we look at politics today and the ugliness that's going on, and it's ugly. Oh, it's ugly. What's the main thing that we have going on between our politicians, especially in our national politicians right now? Name calling. I see the same thing when I go to the elementary school. It's really not different. It's really not that different. Acting like children. Give me something positive. Say something positive. That's what God's saying. Be positive. Don't be negative. Be positive. Build up your treasures in heaven based upon what God has done for you. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given us this to guide us, to inform us, to enlighten us, and to help us change ourselves into the image of righteousness that you wanted us to be from the very beginning. And Father, sometimes we fall and sometimes we walk away and sometimes we forget these words. The Lord engrave them on our heart. Convict us when we're wrong and bring us back. Your grace is boundless and, it, and it's there new every day. And we should come back to you new every day and ask for your grace. The world has easily led many people astray. But you are the foundation and the rock. You are our strong fortress. Father, please draw us back into that mindset. Draw us back so our hearts can lead the life you want us to lead. So that we can follow you and not this world. We love you, Lord, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.